This is Glenn Lowry. I want you guys to know that The Glenn Show is moving to its own YouTube channel. If you don't want to miss new episodes, then I'd encourage you, please follow the link in the description and subscribe to The Glenn Show at the new YouTube channel. You can also help us out and help the channel grow by commenting uh, and by hitting the like button, you know, the YouTube algorithm. So that's the announcement. Stay tuned. There's much more to come. Well, now, if anti-tribalism was one of the uh, raisons d'etre of, uh, of uh, your, your initiative with uh, blogging heads, you, you, you seem to have struck out, maybe not at blogging heads, but for the journalistic enterprise altogether, uh, you know, that, that sounds so quaint and, and kind of idealistic. Uh, I think all the gloves are off and everybody is in their corner. They've, their camps are formed. And, and you know, uh, what a shame because uh, I, I speak of journalism uh, across the board. What a shame because one doesn't know where to find an honest broker anymore. It is a problem. I mean, it's the uh, it's kind of. Uh, uh, I devote a lot of thought to it and I've done some writing about it. Um, and I mean, my newsletter, the non-zero newsletter, uh, which is is also is put out by the non-zero foundation as which also is the umbrella that uh, blogging heads is under um, devotes newsletter in the newsletter. I devote a fair amount of attention to this problem. And I and I plan to start devoting more soon. You know, I've written in terms of my books, I've written about evolutionary psychology. My last book was about uh, yeah, Buddhism and also mindfulness meditation and, and, and the role that mindfulness meditation can play in combating, uh, you know, what is sometimes called the psychology of tribalism, which is what I called it in the book. That's uh, why Buddhism is true. The name of the book is Why Buddhism is True. I, I apologize for the, uh, for the, for the uh, audacious, uh, the, the title, or, or the lacking in epistemic humility title, I guess we might say. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, first of all, I should say, I'm talking about the naturalistic part of Buddhism. I'm not talking sure. about rebirth and the, and the more kind of exotically metaphysical or, or, or traditionally religious parts, the gods and so on. I'm talking about um, why I think Buddhist philosophy and practice really adroitly uh, isolate kind of the problem with human nature and uh, and and try to do something about it and uh, and that includes as it happens uh, I think attacking um, some of the the kind of cognitive biases that constitute the psychology of tribalism I mean I mean uh, you know it's a very it's a very anti-tribal philosophy I think in practical terms and and that's the part. That's the part that I'm saying I'm arguing is is, is true. I, I I am willing to defend that uh, that that the Buddhist diagnosis of the human predicament, um, and the uh, you know including some somewhat arcane I guess uh, you could say metaphysical doctrines although not the religious ones um, and the and the and, and at least uh, some in what are in some traditions the Buddhist uh, regimen of practice. Uh, I, I'm willing to 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 defend those as as really uh, deeply valid and and very important right now. This is um, a line of thought that you've been developing consistently from non-zero uh, through the evolution of God uh, to why Buddhism is true. I can grasp uh, even without a deep immersion in uh, your canon the. Um, you know, I can grasp the as an economist, you know, somebody who knows a little something about the prisoner's dilemma and, you know, mm -hmm. about problems of non-cooperation when everybody would be better off if we could just figure out a way. But everybody wants to kind of self-aggrandize a little bit. They want to, you know, kind of do the a little bit better for themselves. And uh, they, you know, anyway, uh, not to wander into your subject matter, but I but I see. I mean, what I admire here is this persistent development of uh, what is a fairly compact set of ideas through uh, social science into spirituality and uh, into evolutionary biology. That's that's pretty impressive, Robert. Well, thank you. It's um, 
I, I, I have, I, I don't know whether it's good or bad when you, when you kind of are obsessed with a single worldview and are, um, are, and are just kind of trying to illuminate different aspects of it, but I'm glad you see the continuity. It's, it, it, it might not be evident to everybody, but, but you're certainly right to focus on the non-zero sum game. Uh, you know, I mean, as the, as the title of the book and the newsletter suggests, I think those kinds of games are important. The, the, the thesis of the book was that um, one way to describe the uh, trajectory of human, uh, you could say cultural evolution, you know, broadly speaking, if, if, if cultural ev evolution includes, um, you know, political ideas, science, religion, all, all, you know, the entire body of non-genetically transmitted information that makes up the human heritage, right? Um, one way you could uh, describe that over the last, uh, well, one, one, one thing it has done over the last 10,000 years is move human social organization from the level of, of kind of hunter-gatherer society to uh, a global civilization. And I, we're even on the verge of a global community. And the way in the book I described, I said, you know, much of the driving force there was that technologies come along that either facilitate or otherwise encourage the playing of non-zero-sum games over larger expanses of territory and including more and more players. Like, you know, I could, a lot of information technologies going back to, you know, cuneiform and, and, and transportation technologies and so on. But anyway, to, to cut to the chase, we are now at the point where I think uh, non-zero-sum relations, that is to say, uh, you know, games with potentially win-win outcomes or lose-lose outcomes uh, encompass the whole planet. So, classic example would be, uh, well, one would be climate change. We solve sure. the problem. Pretty much most nations are better off. We don't. They're worse off. That's non-zero. That's a non-zero-sum game. It, it's, it's not like a tennis match where there has to be one winner and one loser. That's a zero-sum game. Uh, nuclear war, you know, you know all this, of course, but nuclear war... Yes. Um, non-zero sum. If you don't have one, you both win. If you if you have one, you both lose. And and the very essence of economics, certainly market economics, is a voluntary non-zero sum exchange, right? Indeed. And and um, so and that's an important part of the story I tell in the book. But the, but the uh, the point, you know, I, I'm saying that the point we're we are now at a point where we have a lot of non-zero sum games among nations. That, you know, the famous ones, climate change, avoid nuclear war, but I think more and more, you know, controlling bioweapons, uh, well, controlling contagious viruses, right? Indeed. Classic non-zero-sum thing here where your fate is positively correlated with the fate of someone around the world. Every time the virus spreads anywhere, that's bad news for us here. Every time they hold it in check anywhere, that's good news for us here, right? And And that's a... That's the very definition of a non-zero-sum game is that pe the, the fortunes are positively correlated to at least some extent, not necessarily perfectly. There are zero-sum dimensions to the pandemic and so on. But I think the pandemic is one of many examples uh, of more and more non-zero-sum relations among the people of the world, many of them created by technologies, you know, uh, we don't need an arms race in space. We don't need an arms race in artificial intelligence. You know, there are a lot of, or, or uh, cyber war, you know, there are a lot of things that would be in our mutual interest to control. And I think to get, to control them, you're going to need a lot of policy at the international level. But, but for that to even become realistically thinkable, I think you're going to have to get the psychology of tribalism under control. I mean, not just within this nation so that we can propose coherent policies that we would actually abide by right that would be nice but but the, but but the 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 kind of you might say tribal tensions that divide the nations right that that we seem to be moving from one kind of war war on terror back into a new kind of cold war and 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 if that is uh too uh riven by tension and hostility that's going to make it very hard to solve these problems so um well, I'll stop. I've been talking for a while, but but I guess you get the picture. Well, you're interesting. No, I'm just sitting here thinking dilemma or tragedy, the, um, prisoner's dilemma or prisoner's tra tragedy. And by that, I simply mean, so the logic of the dilemma is, yeah, I, we're both better off if we cooperate than we are if we don't cooperate. 
but I'm even better off if you cooperate and I don't. That you know, I, and and that's a kind of inexorable lure to right. uh, eschew cooperations. And uh, there may be solutions. We may be able to find devices, uh, whether they're psychological or they're there's some kind of institutional devices that mitigate uh, this thing. But uh, for some problems, I don't know. Maybe it's just a tragedy at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean that is the setup in the classic uh Prisoner's Dilemma, which is of course only only one example of a non-zero sum game, but yeah, you imagine these two prisoners, they're doing their plea bargaining separately and can't talk to each other, and either one of them can snitch on the other. They did the crime together, right? That's the idea. And uh if they if they both stay refuse to cop a plea, refuse to admit they guilt and don't rat out the other one, then they only get one year uh, sentence. But if you rat out the other guy and he doesn't rat out you, you get no years in prison and he gets five, right? That's that's the setup. And I guess, it, you know, it's an example of, uh, uh, it's kind of an example of a collective action problem, I guess. The, the um, but, but, but in a way, it, but, but to take it back to any kind of, uh, uh, any of these international problems, um, yeah, we're we're the U.S. is probably well. It, maybe it's true of a smaller country, but like certainly, if you're Norway and all the other nations are willing to restrict their carbon emissions to keep climate change under control, and you don't, you can get by with cheating. That's the best of all possible worlds. The problem solved, and you don't have to pay the price of uh, you know using more exotic uh, fuels or anything. Um, and and you're right that that's that's the the temptation. I mean, with with any with any of these kinds of problems, the collective action problems, there is this dimension of bargaining where there's a zero sum there's a zero sum dimension, right? And uh, we'd all like to get a better deal, but but honestly, I'm not even sure. I feel we'd be lucky to get to the point where that was the problem, if you know what I mean. It's like. You know, we're not even discussing these things. We're not even talking about whether an arms race in space would really be a great idea for the planet. We're not we're not we're not having these conversations. And one reason is we're spending uh, so much time. Uh, well, our, our foreign policy brain power just seems to me uh, to be spent uh, doing a lot of mainly stupid stuff, you know.